Welcome back to the back room, a procedurally generated dimension of corridors and halls resembling distorted liminal spaces that hosts a sprawling environment of monstrosities. If you don't know what the back rooms are, you should definitely watch my other stuff explaining it after this video and subscribe or I will find you and only noclip your naughty bits so it's basically just castration. With that out of the way, let's take a look at more of the entities skulking through these halls. Wall worms are worms residing in the walls of the back rooms that can grow up to 30 feet in length. These worms resemble, but do not taste like, the common earthworm. They move in an unnatural, seemingly robotic pulsating rhythm. Someone please sample it and make me a wallworm type beat. Wallworms vary wildly in size, with possibly only the environment limiting how big they can get. Worms in level zero and similar levels will be around two feet long, whereas levels with large uninterrupted sections of land can have wallworms as long as 20 feet in length. With unconfirmed reports of worms growing to be around the size of a few city blocks. Wallworms contain robotic cores in their interior, which serve to animate them. These robotic engines differ from worm to worm and are usually in a rusty state of disrepair despite remaining functional. So no, unless you want tetanus in your vagetinus, you cannot stick these cores inside of there. Some wall worms have been described as a layer of skin, approximately one lambskin condom thick, stretched out around a cylindrical mass of electrical wires that extend from their core, while others have a small core buried deep within an extensive and otherwise natural mass of flesh. To date, no wall worm in captivity or otherwise has been observed to die of natural causes, but they can be killed easily by destroying this inner core. Aside from providing these electrical impulses that allow the wall worms to move, these corroded engines will also produce a corrosive, viscous slime of unknown chemical composition that allows wall worms to eat through almost anything. This residue displays highly acidic properties and is highly flammable, threatening to make entire colonies and outpost infrastructures unstable if a wall worm infestation is not dealt with immediately. Backroom's life hack, you can milk these worms and collect their acidic secretions in glass almond water containers. After you recover from milking your worm, plop a napkin in the top and light it on fire. Essentially, you have an acid bomb and a Molotov cocktail all in one. If the flesh of the wall worm is damaged or removed, it will be fully regenerated within a period of two days via a chemical reaction that causes a wall worm's acidic slime to congeal and coalesce into new layers of skin. If you're desperate enough, you can carve out small sections of this worm and cook them for food since they'll grow back, and you can basically use this creature like a living flesh farm. This is the Game Master. This entity is the only entity that inhabits level 389, aka the Gaming Hall. She resembles a human-sized doll with a jester hat and a dress, has stitched X's for eyes, appears to be suspended like a puppet, and because this is my video and you're obviously gonna make me do another Backroom Smasher Pass episode, I'm gonna make her bad as hell. Seriously, human, stop trying to make me fuck the Harley Quinn puppet. It's not funny, it's gonna get us both in trouble. This entity just likes to chill and play games. When playing a game with a survivor trapped inside level 389, the Game Master will always attempt to cheat without the player knowing. However, if called out on her breaking the rules, she will instantly be forced to stop. This same rule applies to the player. It is still unclear what actually happens when a game is lost. Her personality could be described as chaotic and unpredictable, where she will move around in gravity-defying mannerisms as well as her hands having the appearance of being tugged on slash around. She will typically be found tinkering with the game she creates and edits, or laying down on the ground like a rat doll. Pretty relatable, most of my day is spent doing one of those two things too. The Game Master will often go several hours or even days completely limp. While the Game Master exhibits control over the entire level, she cannot leave and claims to be trapped inside. It is assumed that she is a puppet in the literal sense, and something unknown to us is currently in control of her physical body. Alright, this is getting more and more sus by the moment, and that's exactly what I was worried about. The Game Master seems to have powerful telekinetic and reality-altering abilities, being able to create games that break the laws of physics and edit these games without making physical contact. In addition, Level 389 itself seems to move and change its layout to her will. Fortunately, she does not use these powers to harm survivors on this level, except a little bit in the fun way. Any photos taken of the Game Master will inexplicably show up as blank. Well, to you it's inexplicable because you don't have interdimensional internet and you haven't seen her post about content theft from her OnlyFans. Scorpses are scorpion-like creatures that like to remove heads from dead bodies and talk using their voices. While that's a pretty neat party trick, they can do a lot more than just your average talented puppeteer that just happens to use decapitated human heads. They can psychically project the deceased's memories. 
If they cannot find a pre-cut head to communicate with, they will use their club-like tails to bludgeon wanderers to death and use their heads for communication. They measure on average 10 feet or 3 meters long and weigh around 200 pounds. When they have a human head to speak through, they are about as intelligent as a regular human being. But without it, they are about as dumb as a regular scorpion. Once in possession of a human skull, scorpses are able to project mental images into the minds of anybody within a 50 feet radius. These images will be composed from memories belonging to the decapitated head, but are used by the scorpses to communicate through a vaguely understood pictographic language. The scorpses will torture their victims with disturbing memories such as the deceased dying moments, hysterical shrieks and laughter, or images of a dead person fondling their bits to porn you didn't even know existed. However, as the brain matter within the skull continues to decompose, the entity will also begin to lose its enhanced intelligence until it is unable to project telepathic images and is returned to its baseline intelligence. When this happens, scorpses will proceed to seek out another corpse which they can decapitate and use to start the cycle all over again. The circle of life never ceases to amaze and inspire me. That's it for this episode. If you want me to come back to back rooms and do more such things, make sure to like, comment, subscribe with all notifications enabled, or I'll turn you inside out. These are the woodlands. They manifest as face slash humanoid like carvings, most commonly in wood. Woodlands are entities that visually manifest through the patterns found in plank wood, the interior of logs, or other materials that appear at least visually similar to wood. Its exact form varies, but generally it appears as a humanoid figure or face. They can also scrawl threatening or taunting messages in the wood. The woodlands' verbal assaults consist of death threats and body shaming, but trying to cancel them by carving it into wood hasn't done any good. When exiting its surface, its physical body seems to be made from the material itself, and the entity becomes corporeal. The woodlands target wanderers that are losing their grip on reality. Now, there's a fine line between being paranoid and being cautious in a dangerous situation. A backroom's wanderer needs to be able to jump rope with it. If the target is mentally healthy, or at least as close as you can get in the backrooms, they'll stalk them for miles and make their presence known to induce paranoia. Once a wanderer is questioning the nature of their reality, the woodland will partially noclip out of the surface and grab them before pulling them inside. And disappearing. The Wanderer will then be partially no-clipped inside of this material, severing whatever is in contact with the wall. Full vertical segmentation is lethal, but if the Woodland only manages to get a part of you in the wall, you can live if you amputate the appendage before it can drag you further inside. This seems like a rock in a hard place thing, cause it's either chainsaw off your genitalia or die. I don't know what I'd pick. Fun fact, the chainsaw was originally invented to make the removal of the pelvic bone easier and less time consuming during childbirth or any other time you'd need to remove a pelvic bone, I won't tell. This creature is the Strangler. Stranglers are furry bipedal hoofed creatures with a large beak and tentacle-like arms to coil around their victim's neck. Their entire anatomy is designed to minimize noise. They have spongy hooves and soundproof beaks to make sure bone crunches aren't too loud for them. They also tend to have a Doofenshmirtz-esque hunch, theorized to be a defense mechanism against other Stranglers, as they have been seen standing completely straight, reaching a height of at least 8 feet tall. This extra height would make it difficult for other Stranglers to attack. Stranglers reside in level 58.1, a dimly lit and very dangerous level. Like the town drunk, stranglers only seem to become violent during blackouts. Blackouts are when all of level 58.1's lights shut off in unison for a seemingly random amount of time. Like a desperate man at a rave, they skulk throughout the dark room, feeling for anything with a pulse. They then grab whatever they find and squeeze it until it stops struggling and begin to consume it. These creatures will do this to their own kind as well. I'm not sure how they reproduce, but regardless, it's definitely a lot of choking with the lights off. I I regret nothing. When the lights turn on, all stranglers flip shit due to sensory overload and scramble back to their dens, dark holes they can tort into and hide in till the next blackout. Stranglers are just afraid of loud noises, so if the level blacks out, just and they won't come near you. The reverse defecation bird. Just when you think you've seen it all, in walks a bird that unshits itself. People are gonna think I made this shit up. I didn't make this shit up. I wish I made this shit up. You can go to the wiki and check. Instances of Entity 40 are extremely common, almost invasive species to the backrooms. Visually, instances of Entity 40 just resemble typical pigeons that would be found populating rather urban and lived-in environments of most western towns and cities. While initially coming 
coming across as extremely basic, almost one-to-one -one replicas of typical birds, the rather numerous instances of Entity 40 possess one distinctly differential and somewhat disturbing characteristic. Sometimes something is just so gold that no jokes about it will even hit the same, so I'm just gonna read this straight from the wiki with very little embellishment. Instances of Entity 40 unshut themselves. Yes, they absorb crap on the ground and bring it back into their own bodies. They are known to force feces from the ground back into their own rear during periods of flight. Instances of Entity 40 have the somewhat unsightly and morbid ability to suddenly cause previously dropped bird excrements to quickly shoot up and become a part of them. My god, I love it. This is unironically my favorite entity so far. How this process is done is unknown, and any investigation is proved fruitless. Sometimes people can get hit at such great speeds with this entity's feces that it can prove lethal. To the untrained eye, it may seem almost impossible to detect when bird droppings may rip upwards towards the sky, or which droppings are ones that can rip up into the heavens. A few seconds before the droppings are going to depart from the ground, they will often act like a magnet towards the bird in question, with any looser parts on the ground lifting or moving up towards the creature, usually happening about 10 seconds before the process occurs. Oh yeah, and there's like a goat that eats popsicles. Entity 666, aka Happy Files, is a string of several websites on the backroom's internet that host instances of an anomalous, seemingly sentient computer virus disguised as various applications. Instances of Entity 666 often masquerade as backrooms file sharing sites such as fileshare.backrooms and piratebay.backrooms or video sharing sites such as youtube.backrooms or pornhub.backrooms. These web pages all share the same name, only differentiated by a set of random numbers within the URL. You can only get onto the backrooms internet in the backrooms or with a powerful force known as suspension of disbelief. Like a toilet seat for gonorrhea, these websites are basically just the carrier for the Entity 666 virus. When an individual is downloading the desired program from any variant of Happy Files, it will instead download as a zip file. Once extracted, there will be an unzipped folder containing a TXT file stating, Thank you for downloading this program. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for using Happy Files. Along with a .exe file with a lower quality version of the original icon for the specified program. Once the .exe has been opened, the individual will now be designated Entity 666-A. The program will be an exact replica of the original counterpart of the specified program with no limitations or paywalls. So if you're willing to put up with this spectral technical crap, you can just get a lot of these free cursed softwares. If the program is a utility type program, there will be an icon displaying the face of Entity 666. If the program is a video game, soon after being opened, the player will spot a digital instance of Entity 666, which will begin to follow them slowly before pursuing at great speed, jump scaring the player. Immediately following this, it will crash the computer and shut down all electronics in the room, including any lights, computers, or vibrators. It will then manifest in the room as an obsidian-colored humanoid entity standing roughly 2.1 meters or 6 foot 8. It has a white porcelain-like face sporting sunken yet somehow bulging, unblinking eyes and an unnaturally cavernous smile. This face never changes in any iteration of Entity 666. Even when I tell him that he has the vibes of the guy at the party who tells everybody to add him on FetLife, he refuses to wipe the stupid grin off of his face. This instance will begin to travel to Entity 666A at a steady and slow pace, and gradually pick up speed. When Entity 666 reaches Entity 666A, it will again jump scare Entity 666A in hopes of causing a heart attack. If Entity 666A has a strong stomach and doesn't suffer a heart attack, Entity 666 will rip all of the wand limbs off and just tell its friends that they died of a heart attack because dead men tell no tales. The file containing Entity 666 will then delete itself from the computer. Alright, f*** it. I wanna play some Red Dead. Then I like totally scared him until he had a heart attack. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. Next up are the skinless. The skinless, as the name suggests, are humanoid figures that look as though they've been skinned with surgical precision, revealing the inner workings of their anatomical structures such as their muscle fibers, bones, vascular systems, and organ structures. They ooze a strange fluid behind them, and when examined more closely, it seems to be a mix of every type of human bodily fluid. Yes, every type. Even, even that one. While these creatures resemble humans somewhat in their passive state, when they enter their active state around human prey, they exhibit some very inhuman characteristics. 
For example, when they see a wanderer, they will stalk it for miles until it can get close enough undetected to strike. The entity will then split open its torso at the rib cage and open up using the ribs like some sort of spooky skeleton bear trap. It will then grab the wanderer swiftly, snap the trap shut with a force on par with the bite of an alligator skewering and trapping the victim in its chest cavity. The veins of the skinless will then detach and move like tendrils to the bleeding holes created by the sharp ribs, and they will weave their way inside of the veins and arteries, digestive system, nervous system, reproductive system, hell, anywhere the wanderer has body fluid. They will then drain the victim of all their blood, saliva, stomach acid, naughty fluid, respective to the victim's sex. They have also been seen laying down with their rib cage open like some sort of horrific mouse trap to pierce the legs of an unassuming wanderer for an easy meal. <laughs> You're all still asking a lot of questions, which I told you not to do, so maybe I'll answer one. What the hell are you? Why are you milking the back rooms? Why haven't you seeked the psychological evaluation that you very obviously need? To be honest, if I see a therapist, I might not be able to connect to my mentally ill audience members. Chances are, that's a significant portion of my demographic. Embracing insanity has done wonders for my mental health. Level run for your life, aka level exclamation point, is a long hallway around 10 kilometers or a little over six miles long. Wanderers can enter this level by using elevators in the back rooms, they can awaken there if they pass out from substance abuse, or just randomly when they least expect it. This hallway resembles that of a broken down crack house of a hospital, down to every last bloody rusted syringe and mysterious bodily fluid puddle. Except there's a constant red flashing light and blaring alarm noise. Immediately upon entry, the wanderer will hear the bloodthirsty shrieks of a horde of murderous entities approaching at Usain Bolti in speed from a long distance down the hallway. These entities include skin stealers, smilers, butthole fondlers, etc. The only way a wanderer can survive is by running the full distance of the hallway and making it to the end. The wanderer will have to evade hospital beds, medical devices, and even clumps blocking the way. If you see another wanderer running, you can trip them and feed the horde for a few more seconds of space. Who's gonna tell? Not that guy. There's also almond water and food scattered around, so if you're like a marathon sprinter, you can stop and have a snack and a drink. Any doors on the sides of the halls are locked. Don't try opening them or breaking them down. Your frail human arms can't interfere with these unknown forces. It'll just waste the time that you desperately need for running from the living wave of monsters that wants to turn you into nutrients. If an especially fit wanderer manages to get to the end, there will be an exit door that leads to a random level, which hopefully isn't just a void. To be real with y'all, I think I think if we dropped every one of my subscribers into this level, around 95% of them would die within the first two miles, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. Adrenaline is a phenomenal drug. Let's get into it. Ready? Go! Welcome to the end of the back rooms. After fighting through hordes of entities, traversing an inordinate amount of hazardous levels, and finally smashing the Game Master, you've pulled up to what looks to be the very last level of this insanity-inducing hellhole. That's right, according to some, this seemingly infinite dimension actually has an end to it. Level 922337203685477507807 is what humans consider to be the final true level of the back rooms. This number is the 64-bit integer limit on a computer, and because y'all are obsessed with simulation technology, the theory is that the back rooms are a simulated reality. Look dude, I've been there. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You humans realize that you're the ones categorizing this. Just because you found carpet land first and called it zero, doesn't mean a literal dimension gives any semblance of a shit where you started counting, right? Your species logic consistently confounds me. This is one of the hardest to enter and most dangerous levels in the back rooms. It looks like a simple, cold, brutalist staircase, around 29 steps tall, that leads upward into an end. Like the frostbitten end of a homeless man's phallus he aimed towards the sky at 7 in the goddamn morning on the sunset strip, the color of the end is not humanly describable. The most one can compare it to is black or white. It is void of any color, so empty that looking directly at it for too long can make humans begin to cry. But I think it's pretty fucking hot. The space continues for at least billions of miles in all 
multiple directions. Beyond this void is rumored to be the front rooms. However, stupid human ape technology has not yet reached a point in which you can breach this void to escape. This is the final level known to man. No official number can be beyond it. I mean, what did you expect? If you can't get past the void, you're not gonna find it. Just because you can't find it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. That's like not looking to your right and then assuming nothing other than left exists. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Human-made cameras have trouble processing this void, as they are terrible at capturing literally anything interesting other than nudes, and sometimes not even then. It is currently rumored that this fake reality, the end, could be a decoy or secret entrance to the true end. There is one exit to this dimension, the elevator right before the staircase. If the elevator opens for you, there are many buttons in the elevator that can take you to all sorts of different places, one of them being level zero. All sorts of entities congregate closer to the end itself to try to find an escape. Either that or they're just playing ookie cookie into the void. The crowds of these dangerous creatures are massive and are often an obstacle to accessing the pit. There is but one entity that lives in the void itself, but it lurks so deeply within the void that there is only one known part to it. It has a long chameleon tongue-like appendage that it uses to snatch entities on the brink of the end before sucking them off into the void for an unknown process that is assumed to be a process similar to digestion. Nah, I'm just kidding. This part was a complete goof that I used so I can look out there unimpeded by the crowds of morons. Snatcherweeds are crimson plants that can be found on the grounds of most outdoor and some indoor levels of the back rooms. When planted, they maintain a crimson color, but they turn black when they are unrooted from the ground. These weeds curl up into tight clumps when in its passive state, and can stretch out five to seven feet when in the presence of prey. Snatcherweeds have been described as strangely sticky, and that's not something I added, it was taken directly from the wiki, so it's not just me being a pervert this time. Wanderers have also reported an odd sensation akin to burning. This burning sensation from the weeds has caused them to be used in many forms of strange Uncanny Valley versions of BDSM. These entities are also known to be able to release toxins similar to the consumption of liquid pain, which is exactly what it sounds like. Unlike Cali weed, Entity 143 leaves are incredibly sharp, capable of causing lacerations and dismemberment. The stems are covered in small, sharp thorns as well. Although difficult due to their variation in length and thickness, it is possible to cut snatcher weeds off. Doing so will cause them to harden, which makes snatcher weeds very useful weapons for those lucky enough to cut a satisfying amount of stem. Snatcher weeds act like normal weeds when not within a five-foot radius of wanderers or entities. However, when the targets are within range, like a man on bath salts who sees a delicious face, the behavior of the weeds becomes erratic. Some, like me, do not get harmed by the snatcher weeds at all, because because they know I'll just roll them up and smoke them if they try. Skin givers are creatures with blood red skin, white sunken eyes, and skeletal arms with hundreds of layers of thick skin on the hands. Since the majority of their weight is in their hands, they move in a chimp-like knuckle-walking fashion. While these wet dreams for those with an elephant titus fetish are extremely strong, they move slowly and methodically. These creatures have the ability to apply extra layers of skin to anything their hands make physical contact with. The skin will grow and wrap around the victim, causing itchiness and heat to the real layer of skin. Imagine your entire body becoming biologically uncircumcised, and it's basically like that. Once contact is made, the skin giver will slowly chase the affected person. Over time, more and more layers of skin will grow on the victim until they pass out due to heat exhaustion. When unconscious, the skin giver will tear open the new layers of skin and eat the flesh of the wanderer. The remaining skin will be left to rot behind. Analysis of this extra skin has revealed that it is almost entirely made from scrotal slash foreskin. These entities have a mutualistic relationship with skin stealers, as they often congregate, and the skin stealer will alleviate some of the weight on the hands of the skin giver by taking the excess skin to patch up their own wounds. This symbiosis was partially the basis for the theory that evolution is at least partially also how life came to be in the back rooms. And also this t-shirt. Next up are the Curabita birds. The Curabita bird is a large avian that looks like it huffs glue out of a bag. Couldn't possibly be more than goldfish level intelligence behind these eyes. Well, that's not very nice, a big jerk. This cross between a glow stick, a soap bubble, and a dodo bird can be found in any level that contains a decent sized death moth population, as they survive off of the smaller male death moths. They use a long sticky tongue to snag their prey and slurp it back inside of their face hole. 
Humans have attempted to use this tongue for exactly what you're thinking, and I'm happy to say it went exactly as poorly as you would think. Other than that, they are mostly harmless when it comes to interactions with humans, as they will flee like a little bitch if they notice any creature larger than themselves. They are extremely slow, only able to locomote by flapping their nearly vestigial wings to pathetically doggy paddle through the air. The Kirabita bird is almost always in a nearly completely dormant state. They can spend days at a time floating in a single spot, only snapping into action when a perceived threat draws too close or when a male death moth comes into contact with their tongue. Like a deep sea guppy to the glow of an angler's dangler or EDP to a cupcake, the death moth is attracted to the bioluminescent tip of the Kirabita bird's tongue and will get stuck in the highly adhesive saliva that coats it. Perhaps the most striking feature of the Kirabita bird is the bioluminescent gel which it stores in the hump on its back. Despite the fact that this gel is semi-solid, it is significantly lighter than air, allowing this strange creature to stay airborne almost indefinitely. You can actually use this to fly, but the caveat is you have to shove a few gallons of bird fluid up your ass. When extracted from the Kirabita bird, the gel will maintain its light-giving properties for up to several days. This window of usefulness can be extended almost indefinitely when the gel is exposed to a significant amount of heat. This means that a jar of Kirabita gel could serve as a constant light source in warmer levels of the backrooms. I've eaten it. Fuck me up real good, although it's pretty toxic for humans. Oh yeah, and also there's this hermit crab that instead of claws has pool noodles and he, he sucks you. Entity 36, known as Cannibal Cuisine, is an anomalous type of vending machine found within the back rooms. They can look like any sort of front rooms brand vending machines. On the back of these machines always reads a tag, Cannibal Cuisine Productions, Iris Family, from humans, by humans, for humans. As of now, no one has a goddamn clue who the Iris Family is or if they even exist at all. Cannibal Cuisines are supernaturally durable and cannot be destroyed using normal methods. These machines don't require any payment to operate, and the internal systems seem to be a blend of biological and mechanical. For example, instead of a metal coil pushing the product off the shelf and into the slot, this system uses a skeletal human hand. And instead of a button, like a human, you would use the clit to turn it on. I regret absolutely fucking nothing. All products made from Entity 36 are made from human parts, and like a noble hunter-gatherer should, Entity 36 uses all parts of the animal. Some of my favorites from these vending machines include small blocks of flesh wrapped sloppily with a candy bar wrapper, entire heart, carbonated blood with sugar added, dick in a box, chip bag containing chips made from human bone marrow, skin strips dipped in gum, and my favorite, the fermented alcoholic piss. Every 12 hours, the products within a cannibal cuisine will all be instantaneously replenished, appearing out of thin air. Products that have not been taken will simply remain inside. While safe to consume for most multidimensional entities, products from Entity 36 spike human dopamine levels so much that humans can get instantly instantly addicted to these products. Addicted individuals devote themselves to obtaining as much food as they can from the cannibal cuisines and are willing to risk their lives to do so. What's that saying? Crack addiction doesn't give a shit whether or not you think you're gay? Multiple wanderers that are victim to the same instance of Entity 36 may also attempt to harm one another to ensure more food for themselves. Normal side effects of high amounts of dopamine include euphoria, binge eating, addiction, poor impulse control, heightened aggressiveness… Oh shit. Besides generally inciting an extreme feeling of joy, products from cannibal cuisines may also cause a few other effects. For example, the complete and permanent removal of any prior memories pertaining to cannibal cuisines. Any further information on the entity is wiped from the victim's memory after an average of four hours. They will also be unable to eat other sources of food and water, including almond water. Attempting to eat non-Entity 36 food items will result in the food remaining in the stomach and not leaving via digestion unless removed by other means. They'll also have increased hunger and thirst, regardless of the amount of food the victim has consumed. Sometimes they even hear voices emanating from the cannibal cuisines, which become more and more prevalent during the machine's replenishment and the consumption of a product. These voices are often described as blood-curdling screams, soft yet discomforting sobs, and or coming noises. Most victims recall that these voices manifest in the form of a loved one from their past life before entering the back rooms. Oxids are small, bronze-colored arthropods native to level 61, although they have been sighted on other levels. Eyewitnesses have compared them to crap 
crabs or pubic lice, albeit much larger and with sharper mandibles. Oxids scurry around various levels searching for objects made out of base metals, such as copper or iron. Much like a snake, they have two glands in the back of their mouths. However, instead of venom, these produce an unidentified acid with the ability to spread rust and oxidation. Once an oxid finds such an object, it will use its acidic saliva to corrode the metal for much easier consumption. If you ask an oxid what that mouth do, the answer would be dissolve. These rusted metals compose its entire diet. Oxids are naturally curious entities and will search any bags, containers, or fleshy orifices for something to eat. Tupperware is recommended as a way to keep them out of your belongings, as plastic does not oxidize. Oxids have strong mandibles to help chew up the rusted metal they live on. However, they will use these in combat if they feel threatened or just bored and sadistic. I'm warning you. I never warn you guys, so you know this is gonna be bad. This entity is cursed. And I'm warning you now because the following content is so foul it goes far beyond the not for human consumption nature of most of the cognito hazards I upload. With that being said, allow me to introduce the most cursed entity in the entire backrooms. The Glock Dookie. This entity empties out a toothpaste tube, fills it with its own feces, urine, seminal fluid, and vomit, and then proceeds to aim the front of the toothpaste tube towards a victim. It will squeeze the end of the tube so as to squirt the contents of the tube out rapidly. This mixture cannot be removed once it touches a person. No known substance can wash the Glock Dookie off. This entity will display different tendencies while in large groups. They've been reported to mass Glock Dookie a victim and then knock out the wanderer with blunt force trauma, pull down their pants, and scream, Get that ass. Soon, a swarm of entities appear and spread the wanderer's ass cheeks open, subsequently spitting into the anus of the unconscious victim. This entity is not cataloged in the wiki or the fandom, and the only place one can find an account of these entities is in a video that I will be linking in the description. It's canon now, and there's not a single fucking thing any of you can do about it. Also, this is the not goldfish. It swims through the air. I'm gonna give you all an AZFK fun fact. I'm 100 meters from your location and approaching rapidly. Start running. Wallpaper wraiths are giant slug-like creatures that stick to walls and ceilings using a red mucus secretion. Their skin is covered in advanced chromatophores, which can replicate the patterns and colors of the walls and ceilings with great accuracy. While this seems like a powerful ability, you can use this to your advantage by leading them to stick to walls with hate symbols and then get them canceled. These creatures hunt by sneaking up on their prey and extending a tendril-like tongue. They will wrap this tongue around the victim, like any skilled murderer, starting with the mouth to silence any screaming. After encasing the prey completely, they will either retract the tongue and eat the victim whole, making every mollusk vorophile's dream come true, or drag the prey back into the nest to leave it for its young. Injuring a wallpaper wraith will cause them to spit a paralyzing black liquid that will freeze any entity or wanderer in place, making them incredibly easy to consume. The tongue of these creatures is easily capable of snapping a human neck. Wallpaper wraith's ears are extremely sensitive, and if the entity hears a loud noise, it'll just straight up have a heart attack and die. Boo! Ah! These creatures usually nest inside of the ceilings, the females laying hundreds of eggs until they literally die from exhaustion from it, like a termite queen or the man chicken. When the young wraiths hatch, they will eat the stash of food, red dead bodies, left by their parents, and then they'll eat their siblings. When there are only about seven left, they will proceed to find their own spots for nests, and then they will start hunting to begin the process all over again. Nature's be so beautiful sometimes. I mean, like, not right now. This is awful, but I don't know, man. Go outside. Reviooks are entities that physically remain mysterious, although there is much evidence to their existence and the destruction that their behavior leaves on its surroundings. Reviooks will burrow into the ground for several weeks at a time, waiting for wanderers or other entities to walk over them. They have the miraculous ability to heal the ground after they submerge themselves in it, leaving no trace of the destruction that got them underground. After a few seconds of a victim standing over the Reviook, it will burst from the ground, grab the victim, and quickly resubmerge to give them the big subterranean suck. The victim is either crushed by the ground or suffocated within minutes, and then the Reviuk will consume the victim, then coughing up an owl pellet-like waste product useful in teaching children about anatomy. The exact physical appearance of the Reviuk is unclear, as they spend most of their existence underground. However, humans have a rough idea of what they look like. They have large muscular arms in the front, and three small legs in the back. Their feet have a spork-like shape, allowing them to rapidly dig themselves under the ground. The head has eight black beady eyes arranged similarly to that of a spider, and just below these are 
a proboscis-like mouth, which makes this creature a low-hanging fruit for BJ jokes. Males will have large white dots on their body, while females will have several tiny white dots. The splat is an amorphous flesh blob with a thick liquid-like consistency. Contain your orgasms, folk. It has several eyes which move around the body before popping back in in a manner that is described to be similar to boiling. These creatures cling to the ceilings of level zero behind doors, waiting for a stupid wanderer to stumble under them. They will make splooshing noises, and apparently it's to attract prey. I'm not saying you won't attract someone, but you're going to attract a very particular and likely very sticky type of someone. When someone enters the door, the splat will latch onto their neck and inject what the wiki calls a poison, but anyone with half a brain knows when it's injected, it's a venom. This venom will cause hallucinations and extreme nausea. I've tried it before for fun, and it wasn't very fun, and I can usually get into nightmarish hallucinations. Most notably, the victim will believe the small room they are trapped in is another hallway, stretching on forever. In the state of their confusion, the victim will inadvertently trap themselves in the room until they die, either from starvation, dehydration, or suicide. The corpse is assumed to be eaten by the entity. If you spot a splat, walk past it slowly. Act natural, but not too natural. And don't run, as like the common movie T-Rex, their vision is based on movement and they seem to be attracted to fast moving objects. You're scared, coward! You got man enough to f with me! You can't last two minutes in my world, b Look at you scared now, you hoe! Scared of the real man! I'll f till you love me! I had to get high. I had to back. I'm not sure if this is the weirdest backrooms entity I've ever seen, but it's definitely up there. Entity 161, more commonly known as Leon, is a toddler-sized leech with a pair of long noodle-like boneless arms that end in little points instead of hands. At the very front of his body, he has a ring-shaped mouth filled with three large sharp teeth. No matter what climate one finds this entity in, his skin is somehow constantly wet and slippery, leaving a visible trail of mystery fluid as he slithers around. No valuable scientific data was gathered by forcing a series of humans to drink varying amounts of it. This entity is always adorned in a white collar, a multicolored necktie, and white tuxedo cuffs placed slightly above the points of his arms. Do not insult his tie. He'll take it very personally. He's also always seen with an exaggeratedly tall and skinny light brown top hat. With him, Leon carries a black leather briefcase which he uses to store items he's collected. Despite looking like a standard briefcase, it's able to store objects significantly larger than both it and Leon himself. This entity has been known to function as a wandering salesman of sorts, and is fully capable of human speech. However, his teeth are so large that he can't seem to close his mouth over them, causing him to have a permanent lateral lift. What the hell did you put me on the show for? I wish one of your guys had children for I could kick them in their fucking head or stomp on their testicles for you could feel my pain because that's the pain I have waking up every day. If a wanderer encounters him, he will usually make an attempt to peddle a small variety of items to whomever he stumbled upon in exchange for the person's blood. Offering Leon another bodily fluid results in him contacting the authorities. These items can range greatly in value, consisting of anything from random junk to highly sought after objects such as royal rations, life insurance, or mescaline. Leon is generally friendly with wanderers, if not also kinda slick. If a wanderer if a wanderer happens to encounter this entity or vice versa, he'll make an immediate attempt to strike up conversation and temporarily join the wanderer on their travels or duties. He'll accompany the wanderer until he's either successfully sold them an item, been shooed off, or simply decided to go somewhere else all on his own. During the times in which Leon is conversing with a wanderer, he'll often make attempts to shift the conversation to the topic of his wares in hopes of making a sale. Leon's not really my friend, he just wants my business. Should the wanderer agree to his products, he'll open up the briefcase and advertise a selection of four to five items that usually range in quality and usefulness. While Leon claims to not be a drug dealer, he does sell drugs. The standard prices of items seem to be completely random, but it is possible to haggle with Leon in order to make a desired item cheaper. At the moment, no pattern on what items Leon deems as valuable has been discovered. I found the man's once, and he was selling a new iPhone for the same price as a rotten apple core. No semblance of value at all. It's important to keep in mind not to touch an item unless you're absolutely sure you want to buy it. For whatever reason, Leon considers any item that has been touched bought, and will subsequently claim his payment whether you're willing or not. Sounds like Leon needs to take those those online courses that they make every college freshman take. Instead of accepting any form of currency or trade for his items, this entity only accepts payment in the buyer's blood. Whenever one decides to purchase an item, Leon's hat will briefly shudder before the top flips open and spurts a purple gas cloud in the face of the buyer like some sort of Alice in Wonderland Nightman version of a Dr. Seuss book. This gas will completely knock out most wanderers approximately 15 to 20 seconds after inhalation. When the buyer is unconscious, Leon will then proceed to plunge his three teeth into one of the shoulders of the buyer 
fire and consume the amount of blood he's owed, using a blood-sucking method similar to that of an actual leech. It's believed the gas his hat spits out is supposed to function as an anesthesia, so the buyer doesn't have to feel their blood being sucked out. It's an instant knockout for humans, but for higher level species it's kinda like getting hit with the dentist gas. <laughs> When finished with the payment process, Leon will leave the area and the buyer will wake up about 10 minutes later with a Y-shaped scar on one of their shoulders, a mild soreness in the arm with the scar, and the purchased item sitting on the ground nearby. This entity is a pussy pacifist and will flee at high speeds if the situation gets violent. If cornered, he'll usually resort to hitting the aggressor with a puff of his knockout gas before frantically scrambling away. The only other times Leon gasses something without an agreed sale comes if one tries to steal something from him, as he'll very often manage to knock out any attempted thieves with his gas before they can get away. Afterwards, he'll take both the payment for the item and the item itself back. Despite his generally pacifistic nature, Entity 161 has unintentionally killed some wanderers in the past by taking too much blood all at once. He doesn't seem to be aware of the fact that creatures actually need blood to survive. Having stated, they can always just grow more. I mean, like, he's not wrong. However, he does seem to favor specific blood types over others. He'll very often bring up blood types as an icebreaker conversation, and seems to generally lower his prices for types that he favors. Currently, it is believed that his favorite blood type is B positive, while his least favorite is O positive. See, I don't even normally use blood for biological functions, but I allocate resources to make it just so I can get more X from the backroom slug dealer. Well, that, and I just throw humans to him for stuff and he doesn't seem to mind. If you haven't seen my other backrooms videos, by the way, you should go watch them if you know what's good for you and value your life. That's it for this episode. If you like this and want me to keep all your limbs, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all notifications enabled. Oh, hey, boy. I don't what. Yeah? Give me the